I thank the member. The question is that this bill be now read a second time. I give the call to the member for Chifley. Thanks, uh, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker. We saw today an extraordinary dummy spit. We had the Treasurer of this country come in here and basically threaten a whole swathe of Australian society that, uh, because he couldn't get his cuts through, he was going to find other ways to hurt ordinary Australians. And whenever he's under pressure, you can tell the, the Treasurer is feeling it, um, because basically he comes in and does a sook. He'll either do it on AM radio or he'll do it here on the, the floor of the House. And you know, he's more uptight about problems of his own making. I mean, the coalition have got themselves to at this point. Three quotes demonstrate the, the problem that they've got themselves into. One, they went into an election saying they wouldn't raise taxes, they wouldn't cut any uh, more spending other than what they've announced, they'd still get to surplus. Magic, just a supreme, uh, supreme uh, source of sorcery, if you will, that they'd be able to get to that point uh, in that way. The second point is they said, and it was, it was expressed by the Prime Minister, no cuts to health, no cuts to education, no changes to pension, no changes to GST, no cuts to ABC or SBS. What he also said, the Prime Minister, on a number of occasions. This wasn't just a one-off. He said it a number of times. And the third one, that, uh, uh, the third quote that has got them into all sorts of trouble, and I'm, uh, I want to read it into to Hansard, is nearly a year ago, at a doorstop, the Prime Minister asked by the media a specific question. Question. The condition of the budget will not be an excuse for breaking promises, and the then opposition leader, now Prime Minister, said, exactly right. So they've gone into an election trying to be all things to all people, and then they've come through and uh, devised a budget that has hurt people across the country. And when the parliament has said, no, we're holding you to account, you made these commitments, the ones that I've just read out, you've made these commitments and we're holding them to it, holding you to it. We then have the spectacle of our, our nation's treasurer come in on the floor of the parliament today and, as I said earlier, um, you know, carry out the, one of the biggest dummy spits you've seen in a long time. Well, they got themselves into this hole, but the problem is they want ordinary Australians to pay for it. And if you want any clearer example of the type of pain that they want to inflict on people, look at what they're doing in health. Look at what they're doing in terms of this bill, which is nothing more than a $1.3 billion tax slug on ordinary Australians, but look at it in the context of everything they're doing in health. Because this is not a plan to manage health care into the future. It's a plan to do two things. One is that they clearly just want to savage uh, expenditure. They clearly just want to take a, a blunt stick and beat that expenditure down. And the second, uh, and, is, and is one that we do need to put more and more of a spotlight on, is a radical reshaping of the Federation. What the longer term game plan is, is to vacate that what the Commonwealth is doing now, that this side of politics will vacate from into the future and force all the obligations onto the states and territories and not be there in terms of trying to provide a national response so that we, we will have, uh, on key policy areas like health, at least a uniform standard that, regardless of where you live in this country, that the excuse isn't because you live in a rural and regional area that you should get a second-rate health scheme and that the only way to get better health outcomes is move to the city, which is, frankly, is unacceptable in this day and age. And there is no health care plan behind what they're doing. The two big things that are going to impact on health are this. One is, as has been you know, from former Treasurer Costello and through the intergenerational report has been well documented, is the ageing of the population. And the fact of the matter is that will always put more pressure on health care budgets across the country, regardless of government. And the second is, and we see it in our community all the time, is lifestyle issues. You know, we have these lifestyle conditions that are triggered by the way we live in terms of how much we exercise, how much we eat, what that does to our longer term health. And there's a reason why in a prosperous nation, and you look in most prosperous nations, you see things, for example, measures like the obesity, the levels of obesity in a country, um, the levels of diabetes. In my area, the other concern is heart disease, the things that come through 
uh, for example, indulging in excessive alcohol and, and smoking and tobacco consumption. These things all have a longer-term impact. They can't be dealt with overnight. And what we've been trying to get people to do is not think that you can pop a pill and figure that that's going to sort you out, that you need to invest in things like preventative health care. Now, if you were to look at the way that they've addressed health care in this budget, what they've done is uh, they've done two things. One is, um, well, oh, let me put it to you this way, let me rephrase it this way. We have, as I've said previously, a health minister who thinks his biggest job is to stop people from going to the doctor. But under this bill, it's not only to stop people going to the doctor, it's to stop people from buying medicine. And the reason I say that, and it may seem like a rather extreme statement to those in the gallery, but the reason I say that is because when you look at the stats, when you um, look at uh, the cost of, uh, or the, the result of increasing the price on medicine and what that does, we've already had studies that have looked at if you increase the price of medicines, what is the consumer behaviour? What's the behaviour of the, the general public? Now, the COAG Reform Council report that was released in early June actually looked at this. And it said, for instance, that 8.5 per cent of people in 2012 13 delayed or did not fill their prescription due to cost. In disadvantaged areas, some of which I represent in this place, the figure is 12.4 per cent. And for Indigenous people, it's 36.4 per cent. That is recent evidence. Now, is this a one off? The answer is no. When you look at the evidence over a longer period of time, you see again a replication of the type of uh, experience that I just outlined. For example, the last time the Coalition were in power, they increased the tax on medicines, and in 2005 uh, they did this. Uh, the uh, prescriptions for some essential medicines fell by as much as 11 per cent. <coughs> 11 per cent. So you can clearly see that um, uh, if you increase the price on medicines, people act in a certain way. And so, as I said, the answer is not to stop people from going to the doctor and stop them taking their medicines. It's to find a way to stop them having to go to the doctor and having to get medicines. And the way to do it is to actually encourage people to see their GP sooner and to be able to determine what preventative mechanisms can be put in place. And the doctors in the electorate I represent tell me all the time the type of things that they're doing, as I said before, to address the top three issues that, in their mind, that they tell me need to be attended to. Obesity, um, diabetes and also heart disease. And you can rope all those three conditions uh, into one, these type of lifestyle-related uh, diseases. Some, obviously, genetic. Your DNA will play havoc sometimes as to why you might get heart disease quicker than others. But generally speaking, there are other things that you do that you could do differently to avoid or minimise risk. And being able to go to a GP and for the GP to put in a preventative health care plan for you um, and to attend to those issues quicker uh, will help us longer term. We obviously, with the ageing of the population, you can't avoid that, that demographic wave. That's going to hit you no matter what. But there are things you can do in, in your middle years or even earlier that can prevent um, a greater uh, impact or a greater variation in the impact uh, in your later years. So being able to see a doctor sooner makes a difference. What's the response of this government been? To try and stop you from seeing your doctor sooner by putting in this co-payment, this GP tax as we call it, and uh, then claim that they're going to raise the money out of that and put it into this medical research fund, which I just think is a disgraceful move, frankly. I'll never be convinced of the value of this move or the merit of this move, because all it does is it slugs the sick of today to pay for the sick of tomorrow, and it is completely unacceptable. And uh, so, they, so they go down that path. And I've already, and I, I've noticed other colleagues uh, in the chamber uh, reflect on the experience that they've had in their electorates, where uh, medical clinics are sending out SMSs encouraging people to go to the, to the doctor to see the doctor, um, because people are thinking that this GP tax, this $7 uh, co-payment, is taking effect now, when in reality it's taking effect from July next year, but they've experienced such a contraction in presentations to clinics that it has uh, caused them great alarm. And the problem is this. Uh, on the other side of the House, they may think it's a great thing. 
that people aren't turning up to a doctor. Well, in actual fact, what it does is potentially put off taking action on the type of preventable conditions that could be dealt with today and shifting the load of that down the track to other generations to pay for. Everyone knows you ignore, and in particular the case of men, men are notorious for not going to see a doctor about any condition that they have, and as a result, it costs them a lot more in terms of their personal well-being and in terms of their finances to fix that condition up. Um, so the key is to get people to see the doctor sooner, to avoid necessarily using medication, and to find a way um, to sidestep the personal and financial cost. But again, I come back to the point that this side of politics has not been able to um, demonstrate a rationale from a health perspective about what they're doing. It is a cruel and crude financial response, and that will see us pay more down the track to correct this. And as a result, not only at an individual level, but also at a state level, um, the type of things that they're doing, the, the cuts that they're making—50 billion in cuts to state and territories for health care. And uh, the argument from the Prime Minister and others who, who appear in the House during question time is to say, oh, no, health, uh, health budgets, we're actually increasing the spending. And they go up every year and they show it. They're increasing health spending at a rate phenomenally lower than what was expected by the states and territories. Phenomenally lower. And it is so low. If the states and territories were on board with this, why would we have the Premier of New South Wales describe the 50 billion, or the 80 billion if you include schools, why would we have the New South Wales Premier describe those, those cuts as a, quote, kick in the guts? They don't see, they're not championing an increase in health care spending because they know what they were expecting was up here and what they are now getting is way below down here. And it might be increasing, but it's increasing at a rate that is insufficient to deal with the costs that they know are coming. Now, in this parliament, we dealt with, in I think it was 2011-12, legislation as part of an overall package of how we support states and territories deal with health care. Because the concern was, by 2046, one component of state and territory budgets would overwhelm all others all others, and that would be health care. If we didn't find a new way to finance health care in this country, states would spend their entire budget on hospitals, on health care. And so that's why we put the deals in place. The only people, and this was a coalition through COAG, Labor and Liberal, it didn't matter a political party, Labor and Liberal, they agreed through COAG, federal, state, local governments, they agreed this is the way to go. The only people who opposed it were the coalition in, in, at the federal level. Why? Because their political interests weren't served in seeing a solution. And so that's what we had there. And now you have this, this combination, this melting pot of issues. You have the GP tax, this $1.3 billion slug through uh, lifting the cost of medicines, this massive, massive cut on hospital and health care. Does anyone in this place think that this is sustainable, that, that Australians will not pay for the price through the first budget of this government, that we will not pay the price down the track for this? It is abominable to think of what we are doing to future generations as a result of this first budget alone on health care, and that we would put people through greater suffering, greater pain, literally in these terms, because of what this government's doing on health care, when they promised people, when the Prime Minister on repeated occasions said no cuts to health. And I'm not just talking about the cuts that they've made in the budget, but they, the Australian people had every reason to believe that when it came to health care, based on what they heard out of the Prime Minister, that he would not conduct the type of vicious attack we are seeing right now on health care. They were entitled to think that. Because he was out there, the champion, the champion against the cost of living, Captain Fluoro. Everywhere you saw him, he was in a fluoro vest, visiting factories, visiting workplaces, saying he was going to attack the cost of living. But he never, ever told people that when he got in, he would cut hospital funding by 50 billion, that he would introduce this co-payment, and that he would also lift the cost of medicine. Nowhere did he say it. And as a result, we have this bill before us now that comes as a shock that will lift medicines and reduce the safety net 
particularly for most vulnerable, and we see all the other things, and we will, Mr Acting Deputy Speaker, pay a long-term price for these short-term decisions.